we will build back and bounce back greener. This is going to be a green recovery with concern for our environment at its heart. Our transition to a clean and secure long-term energy future. As the climate crisis deepens, world leaders often talk about building a cleaner, greener future, but much less about what that future is built from. Solar panels, wind turbines and electric cars all require finite resources stored in the earth. Lithium, nickel and cobalt are just a few. And countries and corporations are racing to secure their supplies. But this scramble for so-called energy transition metals has an environmental cost of its own. And there are warnings that communities across the globe are already paying the price. Take the pristine forests of Halmahera, the largest of Indonesia's Maluku Islands. It's home to the indigenous Hongana Manyawa tribe. In their native language, their name means people of the forest. They are nomadic groups, so they are uh, constantly moving from one place to another place. They see themselves as part of the forest itself. Most of the tribe have some form of contact with the outside world. But as many as 500 people are thought to live in complete isolation. This video, filmed two years ago, is some of the only existing footage of someone from the uncontacted Hungana Manyawa, seemingly angered by the presence of others. This is actually a very a clear sign of the Ohangana Manyawa group that still live within the forest. That they don't want to get in touch with, uh, with outsiders. But the tribe's forest home is now a front line in the global race to extract the material needed for the so-called green future. Under these soils lie the world's largest reserve of nickel a key ingredient for the batteries that power electric cars. It's a resource that the Indonesian government is determined to exploit. It's been courting international firms, including Tesla, who have announced $5 billion worth of investment in this country. Indonesia has tremendous potential, um, and I think uh, it, uh, we're going to look closely from, from a Tesla and SpaceX standpoint to try to do some uh, partnerships in Indonesia. The company running the mine on Halmahera is called Weather Bay Nickel. It's a joint venture between French mining corporation Erame and China's Tsinghan Holding Group, which now produces around 20% of the world's nickel supply. Satellite images reveal a rapid expansion of mining activities on the island since 2010. In Indonesia, mineral extraction is now one of the largest drivers of deforestation. On its website, Erame says the facility complies with the highest international environmental, social and governance standards. But indigenous rights activists allege it's now encroaching on lands inhabited for generations by the Hongana Manyawa. It's a gross violation of international law to be mining on any indigenous land without free, prior and informed consent. And of course, you cannot get free, prior and informed consent from uncontacted peoples. And that's why we're calling on companies like Tesla and other um, electric car companies to pledge not to buy any minerals for their electric car batteries from the lands of the uncontacted Hongana Maniawa. Neither Tesla, Erame, Tsinghan Holding Group or Weather Bay Nickel responded to our request for comment. But Weather Bay, in a previous statement, said, We do respect the fundamental rights of the population surrounding our site and industry. We also systematically operate within a legal framework defined by international standards, Indonesia's policy and regulations and in consultation with local stakeholders. But the threat faced by the Hungana Manyawa is just a microcosm of a struggle that's likely to be replicated across the globe in the coming years. Right now, the majority of nickel is only produced by a few countries, already with devastating impacts. But in order to meet the Paris climate targets and avoid the worst impacts of climate change, experts expect demand for nickel to quadruple by 2050. The struggle for clean tech minerals may only just be beginning. 
And as corporations rush to feed this urgent demand for electric cars and other green technology, there's a risk one crisis is ended by starting another. Simon Roach reporting. Well, I'm joined now by Jeff Townsend, founder of the Critical Minerals Association, the UK industry body for mining and supply of these materials. Now, for decades, the mining industry has had, in truth, a terrible record with indigenous people. But this is supposed to be about a green transition and sustainable future. Is there a different way? Yes, there is. Um, so we have to start with the fact that critical minerals are the building blocks that we need to build this green future that we all want to, to have. Right, we can't achieve a net zero future without critical minerals. Yeah, we minerals, need but... them, but the question is how we get them out while keeping these communities right. and, and respecting them. And, and we cannot accept irresponsibility today to build a better tomorrow. That's just not acceptable. So as an industry, we have to start using and, and pushing the right um, methods by which we do that. Whether that's... So, so what should happen to those people, those indigenous people that we saw in Simon's... We certainly reports. shouldn't be encroaching upon their land. Absolutely not. What well, you've just shown us should not, should not happen. So if there are places where indigenous people say, this is our land, and there may be valuable minerals underneath it, you don't, without, without mine, is that what you're Without saying? the social licence to operate, I don't think it's appropriate to be mining in those places. There are minerals around the world that can be accessed without that. There are ways of mining that are not as impactful as what we have just seen. So if we're going to do this properly, if we're going to build a net zero tomorrow, then we need to do it right from the very beginning accessing and putting uh, life cycle assessments right. in, using technology to make sure our Im impact is as minimal as possible. But, I mean, you're, you're working for these people. I mean, you know, how, what makes you think that this industry that has behaved so badly historically is capable of now behaving responsibly? We are seeing a change. And I'm not saying that there has not been a problem in the past. So I grew up in the mining communities. I know that when things are done badly, they are done very, very badly. But we are starting to see a lot of companies, and actually most of the players in, this more, in the critical mineral space are smaller. So they are trying to do things the right way. Why are they doing that? A number of reasons. You could be cynical and say it's because they have to access ESG finance. Or you could say that it's a new generation coming through trying to do things differently. They're trying to make things uh, more cost effective, which means they're using more technology. And they're implementing life cycle assessments and new, new systems from the very get-go. I mean, are, are there more ethical standards in the financing of, of these industries now? I mean, are the, are the, pe are the people yeah. with the money actually demanding better behaviour? Yes, they are, which is great to see. Now, we, we need to do more. Absolutely, we do. But equally, it's great to see finance saying, right, we're not going to give you money unless you adhere to these standards that we want to be seen. Yeah. Uh, and it's because standards can always be got around, can't they? I mean, we saw that kind of statement there, which talks about laws and international standards. And, and you can follow all of those things while still crushing indigenous communities, right. in truth. And, and greenwashing is one of the biggest problems that we're going to face yeah. in this net zero transition. Right? We need to be better at traceability of our entire supply chain, from mine all the way through... So to... what are you doing that's different? You know, how can we see your members' track record in a different way? Absolutely. Right. So um, we have a number of juniors, and we, we all the way from two-man exploration all the way up to Rio Tinto. And um, we can't say that all of them have got it right all the time, but actually I, I stand by all most of them. Most of them have got it wrong most of the time. Well, they? most <laughs> of them are companies that didn't exist five, ten years ago. They're actually new companies looking at new opportunities, and predominantly in the UK. So actually I, I stand by their records. Now, what I would argue is if we are going to build batteries for electric vehicles. If we're going to build electric vehicles, there's no point in destroying the world to build an electric vehicle and say, look at us, we're meeting net zero. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Right, so what do we have to do? We have to be able to say and show ESG compliance through the entirety yeah. of the supply chain. That's how we do it. And we're starting to use technology, uh, blockchain, we're starting to use life cycle assessments. And we'll We'll, we'll, I'm sorry to cut you off. We've got, we, we've got to stop you there. But thank you very much indeed for coming in, Jeff Townsend. Absolute Jeff. pleasure.